I would like to welcome everyone to the Sugden Oration, or as we're calling it, a conversation uh, this year. Um, my name is Stuart Gill. I think I know many of you already. I'm the Master Head of College at, uh, at Queen's within the University of Melbourne, and uh, we welcome you to this uh, conversation that's going to take place. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, elders past and present, and also First Nations people, wherever uh, our guests are gathered uh, this evening, and any First Nations people who may be with us. Well, in 1995, Queen's College established the Sugden Endowment Fund in honour of its great First Master, Dr. E. H. Sugden. The purpose of the fund is to support academic visitors who reside normally at the college. I'm sorry, Martin, uh, that you're not with us. We hope you come to visit us uh, when, when things clear. And uh, in particular, to fund the Sugden Fellowship. Uh, I would especially like to thank Lady Mary Wright tonight for her ongoing support of the Sugden Fellowship. Uh, Lady uh, Wright, Mary turns 100 next year and uh, she sent me her best wishes from Chichester for tonight's event. And I've promised her that we will send her a recording. Well, in mid-March, prior to any lockdowns, we launched the Sugden Institute that has as its primary purpose to encourage public intellectual debate, and especially to bring together in the public square, the academy, business, government, and religion. One of the issues raised at the launch was the need to encourage greater movement and understanding between the sectors. And there's surely no greater need at this time as we work our way through the wicked issues that we face. We need to be, as I've said elsewhere, future makers, not future takers. Passivity in the face of change is a death sentence. And we need creative and positive responses that encompass scientific, social, economic, political, and cultural factors. Our Sugden Fellow for 2020, Dr. Martin Parkinson, AC, is someone who's worked across the sectors in the public and the private sphere, and now in the academy as Chancellor of Macquarie University. And tonight, I think he will address some of the major issues that we face, particularly in the economy and climate change. He may also touch on higher education. Before I formally introduce Martin, I'd like to acknowledge a few special guests with us this evening. I think we've seen many of them. Uh, we uh, have with us the Right Honourable Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Sally Capp, Professor Duncan Maskell, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, Professor Glenn Davies, AC, the immediate past Vice Chancellor and CEO of the Paul Ramsey Foundation, the Reverend Dr. Peter Hollingworth, AC, former Governor General, the Honorable Scott Ryan, President of the Australian Senate. Um, I could go on and on. There are many other distinguished guests. We have members of council with us this evening, especially uh, President uh, Dr. Ian Marshman, AM. Uh, a number of fellows of the college, and I might just make special mention of Professor Jeff Harcourt, AC, who was Martin's professor and an early mentor at the University of Adelaide. Uh, I only discovered this uh, last year when I met with Jeff in Sydney, and uh, he shared uh, his relationship uh, with Martin. Uh, we've got wyverns, we've got friends, we've got parents and especially students with us this evening. We will have a time for Q&A and please ask any questions via the chat option. I'm delighted that Dan Ziffer has also joined us this evening and who will be conducting the conversation with Martin. Dan has worked at the intersection of journalism and public debate for nearly two decades. He covers Melbourne-based business issues for the ABC, on television, radio, and online. And Dan helped us earlier this year to launch the Sugden Institute and acted as the, uh, the, the chair for the Q&A session that we had. Let me turn to our Sugden Fellow. 
Dr. Parkinson, I'm sure Martin uh, needs in some ways no introduction uh, with this audience. He's one of Australia's most accomplished public servants. He's previously served as Secretary of the Department, Prime Minister and Cabinet, as the Secretary to the Australian Treasury, and as the inaugural Secretary of the Department of Climate Change. He's been a great champion over his career of women being in senior leaderships, both in the private and public sector. He served in the private sector as a director of ORICA on the Kranlana Programme for Ethical Leadership with uh, the German Australian Chamber of Industry and Commerce as a member of the board of the Reserve Bank of Australia and chair of the Australian Office of Financial Management. He was awarded the Companion of the Order of Australia in 2017, having already received in 2008 the Public Service Medal. He's a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, of the Institute of Public Administration in Australia, and a life member of the Australian Business Economists. Martin holds a PhD and an MA from Princeton, a Master of Economics from the Australian National University, a Bachelor of Economics from the University of Adelaide. And as I said, most recently, he became Chancellor of Macquarie University. We welcome you uh, this evening, Martin, and we look forward to what you're going to share with us. Uh, Dan, it's over to you. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, going to have a fascinating evening tonight. Uh, please, with your questions, if you write them in the chat function, I will curate them. We'll have about 15 minutes at the end. We will be wrapped up by seven o'clock. Uh, our 2020 Sugden Fellow, Dr. Martin Parkinson, I won't read the biography. Uh, it is extensive. Uh, the easiest way to say is that if you can think of someone uh, in Australian corporate or political life that you know of only by their surname in the past few decades, uh, Martin has worked with them and has given them frank and fearless advice. We're at an astonishing time uh, of tumultuous change ahead of a really important budget tomorrow. Uh, and the good news is, is I'm assured that Martin has all of the answers to any problem that we uh, face. So we will get to that. Um, I just have two very brief personal questions for him before we get into that kind of structural stuff. You've been secretary to the treasury, you've worked at the IMF, sat on the board of the Reserve Bank, been secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. You're now chancellor of Macquarie University. As you deal with higher education and academia, do you occasionally think it would be easier to going back to just running the country? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey. Um, and uh, who, would have, uh, who would have anticipated um, uh, universities without students on campus? Um, I'm also on the board of um, Cairns and Mackay Airport, so airports without passengers. Um, it really has been a quite uh, remarkable uh, 12 months. So, um, yes, yeah, so well, okay. some of the old jobs look, uh, look pretty easy in hindsight. We will get back to higher education towards the end of our conversation, but uh, before we move on to kind of the structural issues that we want to get into, uh, many people at Queen's are the first people in their family to attend university. Uh, you were the first person in your family to finish secondary education. Uh, many people even watching this tonight are more than aware of the transformative potential that education holds. You have had this career, you now work in higher education in this field. What do you see about the power of education to change people's lives? Oh, look, um, Dan, e education is the ladder. Uh, which, which people are able to, um, uh, to move through society. I mean, I, I, I am a very, very strong believer that as a community, we can do um, you know, the very best that we decide later in life for people. But if we haven't invested in their education, um, starting it at um, preschool, uh, early childhood, then we'll always be playing catch up. Um, and so it's not a um, 
it's not necessarily a popular view amongst um, university academics, but uh, my uh, hierarchy of investment in education is uh, start with kids the earliest possible time you can, um, because you, you find the performance gaps open up really quickly. And when the performance gap opens up, the longer you carry on at school, more often than not, the wider those gaps become. So if you really are concerned about um, reducing inequality, uh, you don't get there by waiting to intervene when the person's an adult. You've got to start when the person's a child and giving, giving everybody the best set of opportunities that they can have. Tomorrow night, uh, Josh Frydenberg will hand down the budget. Uh, obviously, everyone watching this is more than aware of the multiple kind of converging issues which the country faces at the same time, uh, different across the different geographies that we find ourselves in, but a really shared goal of uh, opening up our community and thus our economy in a safe way. What you've, you've dealt with crises before and, and economic crises before, obviously the health advice has to be followed and we have to deal with that in, in the way that we best can to, to save lives. What strikes you about what the government can do, the federal government, in this situation? Well, maybe it's worth stepping back a little bit and um, thinking about this slightly more broadly. It, it, it seems to me that there are three things that um, have stood out to date that, that are all important but different going forward. The first has been the speed of the Australian medical reaction. Um, notwithstanding the terrible events that occurred in Victoria, uh, I think Australia has generally handled the medical response to this quite well. The second has been the speed of the economic reaction. And I want to come back to the, these two uh, things in a moment, um, where, again, the first parts of that um, have been, I think, really quite speedy but the real tests will come tomorrow night. Uh, but the third thing, which is not being remarked upon um, very much at all, and I think has really long-running uh, long running implications for us, has been the absence of an internationally coordinated response. So if you think back to SARS or MERS or Ebola, um, the large countries, the, the leading countries in the world, threw resources at those things, um, even when they were not themselves necessarily being directly affected or only, only marginally directly affected. Um, the challenge here has been that countries have pursued really, in a way, what you'd say, beggar thy neighbour policies. Um, so there's been great coordination, cooperation amongst medical researchers, but governments haven't done the same thing. And that, to me, is reflective of the very significant erosion of trust. Longer true, international order is gone, it's broken. Um, and that brings with it a really challenging issue, which is um, how do we deal with any problem of the global commons? So whether it's um, a medical emergency like this, or whether it's climate change, or whether it's dealing with um, irregular migration, mass migration, um, how do we, in an environment uh, where there's low levels of trust and countries have clearly decided to pursue um, their own interests and not the broader collective interest, that, cha that challenges us really, really deeply about how we think of tackling some of these other big global problems. If I come back to the, the medical and economic response in Australia, I think <clears throat> as you consider how crises unfold, it's worth thinking about them in terms of lags. Um, and, and look, you can think about it in lots of different ways, but I, I find this helpful. 
Um, the first lag is really uh, what I tend to call a recognition lag, which is the gap between the time an event becomes um, apparent and policymakers recognise they need to change course. So that, that's, that's the first lag. The second lag, the reaction or gestation lag, really is the time taken to work out what that course correction should be and then to implement it. And then the third or the or lag or the response lag is the time between the implementation of policy and them beginning to have an, a, an obvious measurable impact. So if you think about the medical uh, crisis, the recognition response and reaction lags in Australia, I think have been really quite short and broadly, they've been highly successful. Um, if you think about the economy though, uh, we've really had only the first two of those things have come to fruition. So the economic recognition and the economic reaction lags were quite short. Um, and again, I think you'd have to say, you know, like it was only a matter of weeks from the recognition of medical emergency to the decision to um, extend uh, job seeker to create job keeper to um, to begin to do uh, to do other things. So, if you think of those first two packages being really about helping us through the medical emergency, then I think we've actually done pretty well as a community. The big challenge for us now, though, is um, how do we get out of the economic crisis that the medical emergency has created? Uh, because we were never going to bounce back in a, in a V-shaped recovery. Um, and, and let me just explain why that is. Uh, in Australia, the only way you get V-shaped recoveries is if the rest of the world goes on uninterrupted and effectively you have a drought. So it stops raining and then it starts raining again. You get a sharp turnaround. Now, agriculture is such a small share of our economy now, it doesn't really impact GDP that, that significantly as, that, as to throw us into recession. Um, so the better way to think of this is really as a um, almost a, a slightly bent square root sign. So think of a square root sign, but reversed. So we go in sharply, we come part of the way out um, reasonably quickly, and then we've got this long period, which is gonna play out for us over the next few years, where we will have to work really hard to get the economy back to where it was. So why, why do we go in and then come out only partly? Um, it's because as we've gone in, JobKeeper was designed to try and stop um, the employment relationship between firms and their workers from hemorrhaging. Because what would have happened otherwise is as soon as people realise the magnitude of the drop-off in GDP, so the sheer pace of the decline and the magnitude of the decline are absolutely unprecedented. What we don't know is the duration. You know, if you think about it, this is the long flat will only gradually improving bit. How long will that be? Um, but what we do know is that we would have seen employers go through a really, really significant restructuring of their businesses. And we did see that with some, so Qantas and Virgin, um, you know, some of the other um, tourism and entertainment uh, providers have had to do that. But in the whole, we've actually managed to hold a lot of those employment relationships that would traditionally have been broken in a recession, hold them together. What we don't know <clears throat> is how many of those are being, um, are really zombie jobs in zombie firms. And we won't really know that until we begin to see the place open up. Well, let's get to that. Obviously the most obvious parallel when we talk about lags is dealing with the issue of climate change. Uh, very slow acting, extremely impactful, but action needs to be taken now, highly expensive action to prevent a catastrophe down the track. We'll get to that. Just before we move off this economic section, 
Um, you talk about zombie companies there, the companies that are alive in, in name only. You know, the wind back of uh, some of those supports, Job Keeper, Job Seeker, the coronavirus supplement is on in earnest and will we'll taper out. There are also things that people might be less aware of around uh, essentially a drought of insolvencies, companies keeping going, changes to continuous disclosure laws, which are uh, mean companies don't have to inform the market in the same way, and kind of mixed in with uh, changes to responsible lending that are coming out, but also uh, changes to insolvencies that essentially mean that companies are able to trade whilst insolvent. How much of an issue do you think there is going to be in the kind of next in the kind of coming six months to a year as these really broad supports job seeker and job keeper are trimmed back and some of those temporary protections uh, have kind of masked a potentially really substantial problem in private business I think you're spot on and uh, I don't think we need to look any further than the insolvency practitioners themselves who are basically saying, the next 12 months is going to be incredibly busy for them. I mean, we know that, that in a usual recession, firms, particularly small businesses, hang on and hang on, hoping that things will turn around. You know, large businesses delay their restructuring as long as possible. Small businesses basically try and um, they, they run down what limited capital that their owners have. Um, and typically it's about 12 or 18 months after the recession is really bit that those people suddenly come to the conclusion that they can't keep carrying on. So <clears throat> job seeker, sorry, job keeper and the other provisions that you highlighted will have um, uh, stretched that out a little bit. But I think, you know, you, you can't go past the, the views of the professionals in the area who basically are saying, uh, the next 12 to 18 months is going to be incredibly, incredibly busy. We've had these issues. We, we've actually had an amazing response from the government who, having spent decades and, and the most recent election campaign, uh, pushing very hard on getting the budget back to surplus and kind of def and de deficit and debt uh, being the enemy, thrown that out the window and taken on a substantial program that was, you know, as, as you've said, utterly necessary to keep things going. As time has gone on and as it will continue to, do you see that kind of pragmatism continuing or will, understandably, uh, the ideology of the government that was elected on a certain platform start to creep back in and, and make decisions that might in the long term have a really substantial negative impact? That's a really good question. I, uh, I'm, I'm not going to squib it, but I am going to say I don't know. Um, you know, Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg are absolute pragmatists. Um, so I suspect you will see for the next couple of years, so you know, this budget, the next one in May next year, um, I can't imagine anybody will be thinking in terms of um, winding back the, uh, the extent, you know, essentially being ideologically driven um, desire to get back to, um, to balance. Uh, what we do know is the nature of fiscal policy and the nature of monetary policy is going to be different going forward compared to the weight that's been on each of them over the last 15 years or so. You know, arguably, um, we have put way too much emphasis on monetary policy and not enough on activist fiscal policy. Uh, and that's both in the sense of um, you know, it being Keynesian on the way into a crisis, which we were in the GFC, and we were insufficiently Keynesian on the way out of the GFC. So the criticism never, in my mind, was that um, the Rudd government's first and second packages were wrong it's that once the situation had changed, their um, ideological commitment or political commitment to still delivering what they had in the second package um, was what got them into trouble. Uh, and basically is, is, I think, made it quite difficult for us to have the fiscal armory that we would have liked to have had. What's been beneficial for us, though, is that interest rates globally are so low 
that monetary policy doesn't have to worry about inflation. There is no inflation. There's not going to be any inflation uh, for a very, very significant period. So monetary policy can focus on essentially uh, keeping interest rates low, ensuring markets are, are open and um, sufficiently liquid so that the private sector can fund um, the very necessary uh, deficits that governments are going to run. But, you know, yeah. as I, I, was asked, I was asked this morning, you know, in your lifetime, could you ever have imagined, you know, uh, a budget where the deficit might be a quarter of a um, trillion dollars, $250 billion, and Australia's debt level could have gone through 40 and perhaps heading to 50% of GDP, you know, debt levels of over a trillion dollars. Well, the answer to that is absolutely not outside of wartime because it just doesn't happen. It's not the, not being the Australian way, um, irrespective of who's formed government. We The initial government stimulus packages we kind of forget now, but were things like an instant asset write-off, essentially encouraging and assisting firms to take on more debt. Um, they were very poorly taken up due to the kind of crisis period, which we kind of forget now in that whirl of March where quite literally the state government was booking Jeff Shedd as a potential hospital slash morgue. Um, we've had a few other stimulus packages like Home Builder, this kind of renovation-based rescue. Um, I, I guess very similar to my last question, that do you see the capacity here that the government can do things that are far beyond their can, far beyond where they have been practically? Because many of the things that are put up as suggestions are almost out of like, Jeremy Corbyn's election manifesto. You know, these are a really big stretch to try and say, you know, can the Australian government take on some things that even Jeremy Corbyn in the UK would have gone, you know, electorally, it's a bit dicey. I, I, I wouldn't think that uh, Jeremy Corbyn is writing uh, the government's um, economic <laughs> manifesto. Uh, I, I can assure you that uh, that will be coming out of the Treasury and the Treasury are... Um, are very, very focused on, on uh, the employment challenge. Um, look, one of the things, and, and perhaps this, this highlights um, the question that you're, you're asking, the next step in this, so the response to our third lag, the economic recovery, requires measures that deliberately stimulate economic activity. Um, now, the traditional things like infrastructure projects, particularly shovel-ready infrastructure projects um, and tax cuts, uh, they, they will clearly be part of, of, what's, uh, of what's proposed. The thing that I found striking, though, is some of the other things, such as um, you know, the renovation rescue uh, type packages, is really about stimulating activity in traditionally male-dominated sectors. And yet, where has the, the initial impact of the crisis been? It's been on women and young people. Now, um, what the long-term consequences of the crisis, therefore, are likely to be quite different to what we saw in, say, the early 90s recession, where it was heavily concentrated in prime age males. And so those sorts of responses, which we've seen to date, make a lot of sense if you're fighting the early 90s recession. But this time round, we know that um, uh, in terms of um, closing the gender pay gap, the recession's going to knock that. We know that in terms of um, the distribution of lifetime superannuation savings is going to go negative uh, in terms of the, the ability to, to close that gap. We also know that uh, when you enter the labour market, the economic circumstances of when you enter shapes your lifetime income. So in other words, the, the pattern of wage increases through your life might not change very much, but the level will be lower because of where your starting point is. So one of the consequences is that we're going to see um, young people being uh, poorer than um, 
than they would have anticipated. They're just their lifetime incomes won't be as high. And uh, young people and particularly women of all ages um, suffering in the superannuation side of things. So whatever comes out tomorrow, to me, has to pass two, two tests. Are they going to be sufficient to encourage jobs and growth in the short to medium term? Um, and the sorts of things that we've heard about to date um, all look like they tick that, that box. Uh, the second test, though, is are they in areas that are going to build Australia's capacity to grow and to be competitive um, over the years ahead? Now, uh, you know, to get that second one answered positively, you've got to go um, away from the traditional agendas and you've got to start to ask, are we fostering innovation? Are we fostering research and development? Are we digitising the economy fast enough? Are we automating in the right areas fast enough? Are we taking the opportunity of all this money that's going to be spent to put ourselves on a pathway where we generate really big co-benefits out of this spending? And the obvious area here is around climate change. Um, if we were to, if, even if we just picked up, for example, the IEA's um, manifesto, the Sustainable Development Manifesto that they developed with the International Monetary Fund earlier in the year. And the IEA or the International Energy Agency are not a bunch of crazy lefties. These are as, you know, the, the, these are very, very conservative people. But they're pointing out that there's a massive opportunity here to get co benefits. So if you think about it, if we invest in energy efficiency, that is, we, we basically create heaps of jobs all over the country um, in improving the energy efficiency of houses and businesses. Um, and if we do that, uh, not only do we create massive jobs, massive numbers of jobs, and have them distributed all over the country, but we end up with co-benefits that firms and households face lower energy bills going forward. If we took the opportunity to uh, electrify industrial processes, then we can both uh, over time reduce our fossil fuel use um, while actually improving the efficiency of, uh, of how, we, how we do things. Um, if we were investing in uh, electrified um, transport networks, for example, you know, again, there's a range of things here that um, are all doable with current technology and then there's the things where you've got to basically be a bit more speculative about and invest in things that are a bit more like moonshots. So it's pretty clear if you look at Europe, um, quite a few countries in Europe in terms of their recovery packages are going to invest in those sorts of things. If we don't, we will actually be left behind. So the big challenge when you look at the decisions tomorrow night are we looking through the front windscreen or are we looking in the rear view mirror? And if we're looking in the rear view mirror and doing more of what we've done in the past, there'll be a, it'll be a lost opportunity. If we're looking through the front windscreen and doing some things that are going to boost our innovative capacity, our technologies, our research capacity, and equally start to think about how we engage with other countries in the world um, in a way that has a a sustainable um, strategy for engaging countries in Asia, for example, um, then you'd have to say it's a big success. But we won't know that until we see the see the, the detail tomorrow night. Well, on that, on climate change and energy, uh, and I've had, uh, sorry, we have some wonderful questions here from very eminent people. So we'll get through mine and then we'll uh, put them to you. I hate uh, to think what David Carolli is going to ask me because I won't be yeah, able to. Uh, so we have uh, this kind of lost decade, which is stretching out beyond a decade now of yep. industry uncertainty. Um, we have a rooftop solar boom essentially pushed by that. People have taken their own control of the situation. Uh, as consumers. Industry has moved beyond uh, the kind of politics and the movement uh, to try and seek their own future and consensus because this issue has been so fraught. Uh, we've seen, and you talked about the medical uh, 
reaction. We've seen how COVID has been able to mobilise different countries to throw everything at a problem very quickly. Because climate change lacks uh, the visual urgency, even though we've just had the bushfires, you know, and we know that sea levels are rising, they're not rising right in front of our face. Um, how, you know, do, do you believe that this might be something that comes out of either this government or future governments that will harness the kind of energy that we put into this specific health problem in a really fast and expensive way to deal, to avoid a catastrophe and do the same for the environment? So, as I said earlier, the erosion of trust um, between countries makes it really hard to get progress on, the, on issues of the global commons. So in a way, quite ironically, um, we've got reduced prospects for globally coordinated responses on climate change, but enhanced prospects of individual countries just getting on and doing stuff themselves because the eroded international collaboration prospects are because um, you know, this loss of trust but the need to stimulate your economies is what's creating opportunities for individual countries to do this. So you can see this in the Germans have committed um, massive amounts for a hydrogen strategy, um, you know, elements of what Biden has called the Green New Deal um, uh, are being picked up all throughout Europe. Um, so lots and lots of effort going on there um, about uh, ensuring that a, sh a fair chunk of the stimulus spend actually goes towards things that are going to help position Europe better for climate change. We will see um, when we uh, know the outcome of the US election, whether the US is likely to change position, but you could easily imagine a Biden administration um, essentially going back to the threats of tariffs um, reduced US market access as a way of geeing other countries to take faster action. And if we, <clears throat> if we miss the opportunity of the stimulus that we will be putting into the economy you know, effectively from now on over the next few years, um, then we will pay a very large price down the track. We will pay it both in terms of the climate change impacts on Australia um, and, and in particular, you know, people, a lot of people seem to think that the, the cost of acting is mitigation, um, but it's actually the cost of inaction is, is huge. And whether you, you know, you've got to mitigate and you've got to adapt. Um, we are unfortunately, and again, the IEA has been quite clear about this, even if countries do what they've said they'll do it, in the Paris commitments, we're on track for 2.7 to 3.5 degree temperature increase. Um, I'll defer to, to David. He he can you know, he can give us more detail on on just how grim the situation is. But I think um, for Australia, if we don't decide to tackle this ourselves, then we will be forced into it because other countries will uh, will restrict our ability to trade with them. Uh, thank you. I, have, uh, I will start with questions. Uh, the first one is from David. If everyone, anyone else would like to submit a question, please do so on the chat function. Uh, David Crowley, one of the world's most uh, eminent climate scientists, asks, if you were seeking scientific advice on the role of natural gas as part of the transition to a zero emission economy, would you seek advice from the chief scientist or from 25 expert climate scientists or both? Um. <laughs> I would seek it from both. And again, David will probably um, give me the rounds of the, um, the playground uh, for what I'm about to say. Uh, we, we have to use gas for a period of time. Um, and the challenge for me is to get people to think about it in the right way. 40% of gas is used as a feedstock. That is, it's not used for power. So we don't yet have um, technologies that allow us to replace um, hydrocarbons in lots of areas. We, we do in some areas, 
um, and there's a lot of promise in, in, in some others, but we will end up having to use gas as a feedstock for um, some years to come. And again, we're, we always talk about net zero by 2050, not gross zero. So, you know, that means that we may still be consuming hydrocarbons, um, but we'll be having to do other things to get the, the balance sheet um, to be net negative. Um, but in the power sector, it seems to me that you've got to draw a distinction between, am I talking about gas for a thousand megawatt power station that looks, you know, like your classic Liddell, your lawn, Hazelwood, but just using gas, in which case no person in their right mind should go ahead and build that because that's an asset that's going to live 40 or 50 years and will almost certainly be a stranded asset. If, on the other hand, you're talking about open cycle gas turbines, which are essentially just build a shed, put a bunch of jet engines in, use them as um, peakers and affirm uh, the electricity supply, um, then they only have a life of five to seven years and you throw them away. So we could actually accelerate the uptake of renewables by recognising that we need to use gas in that form. And if we've got the technology breakthroughs in five to seven years' time, then we don't replace them. And if we, if we haven't, well, we can replace them, but we're only making a commitment for five to seven years at a time, not a 30, 40, 50-year commitment. Martin, you've used the word megawatt, and I have enough TV experience to know that means we have to move on. Uh, there's a broader question uh, from Simon Torrey. Uh, on the, the nature of uh, education and its ability to transform people's view, uh, how can the US educate politicians to increase how independent scientific advice is received so it is viewed as fact and evidence and not just opinion? How can the US? No, sorry, how can government? So oh, how, how, how can we? Scientists how can we? and people who are actually expert in their field uh, get their message across to government uh, to basically say this is based on facts and evidence and we should do this. This is not just an opinion in, in the crowd. Yeah. Um, well, I think the first thing to recognise is that uh, there are some pretty strong vested interests out there that have succeeded over time in damaging the influence of science um, in the debates. Uh, and if you just sticking with the climate change story, if you want evidence of it, read um, Marion Wilkinson's recent book. It's an absolute, it, it, it's, it's horrifying when you realise just exactly um, how uh, cold-blooded people were when they went about diminishing, uh, undermining the credibility of science. Um, how do we, how do we, do this. I think I don't think it's a mistake to talk about this as if it's just a problem with science. If you look across most of our institutions, um, there's been a significant erosion of public trust. And indeed, um, at the last uh, the 2019 Edelman survey, there was not one. Um, part of Australia's institutional structure that they were um, surveying on where people felt they uh, trusted the intent and the competence of, um, uh, of the players. Uh, partly, I think, what's gone on is the rise of social media means that um, I can get my facts, in inverted commas, by talking to people who've got the same biases as I have. Um, the, the erosion of the business model of mainstream media has meant that mainstream media has basically is attached itself to ideological positions that it didn't do in the past. And that has just created an environment where it is really easy to bring people together, um, unified by what they oppose, rather than unified by what they support. Um, and... That, to me, is what the, the scientific community is experiencing, but is it's experts in every field. Expertise is no longer recognised for what it is. 
I have a few more questions before we need to wrap up. Uh, from Jane, Martin, the COVID crisis has focused the government's attention when there are so many other significant issues receiving little attention. If you were asked to advise the federal government about appropriate recognition of Australia's First Nation people, what would be your best and ideal advice? Well, you, given the role that I previously played, you can imagine that I have done this. Um, look, my, my view is that um, <clears throat> Australia has to stop using Indigenous Australians as window dressing um, to make ourselves look good on the global stage. So think about it. Um, you know, we trot out Indigenous culture when we try and have an impact. Well, actually, you know, why don't we actually really get serious about providing Indigenous Australians with the opportunities to participate more fully in, in our community? Now, to be fair, if you look where the most, the largest number of Indigenous Australians are in Western Sydney, for example, most Indigenous Australians in that part of the country look like other poor Australians in terms of um, uh, how they're going on, on the various um, social measures. The problem we've really got, though, is that everything is seen through a deficit mentality and people focus, therefore, on where there really are hard problems that got dealt with in regional and remote Australia. Um, so I, I don't think, uh, as, much as, as much as a treaty or um, a voice or, or the like, all would be part of um, an appropriate package, the first thing has to be creating pathways for Indigenous Australians to have the same opportunities that every, every other Australian has. Uh, thank you to Jane for that question. Uh, from Ross Williams, what do you see as the role of state governments in promoting recovery? Do you see state borrowings as a potential problem? Uh, I do for a couple of jurisdictions, which for obvious reason I won't name at the moment, um, but I don't see it, for example, New South Wales um, doesn't have any, any inhibition. Victoria is, is, in, is in reasonable shape. Um, uh, the states have to basically participate in the recovery because what they can do is, is slow the pace of recovery. So the first thing, for example, opening up. Uh, um, tourism, the loss of tourism revenue is heavily, heavily concentrated geographically. Um, and some of those communities are going to do it really, really tough. So we need to open up the state borders and get Australians moving around the country so that we've got a better chance of spending some of the monies that people like us would have spent on overseas trips in other parts of Australia. Um, second thing that the states can, um, can do if they get things wrong is slow down the speed with which stimulus monies actually get spent. That is, if their regulatory approvals or their, their planning processes um, aren't up to scratch, uh, you, you run into really long delays. And again, uh, um, go back the early 90s recession, uh, Paul Keating's One Nation um, package came down in February 92. Um, we got no real apparent lift off in the economy uh, before the September quarter um, 93, and by the time we got to August 94, the economy was booming its head off, and the reason being was that all of those infrastructure projects um, took so much longer to get started than we had anticipated, and they all hit the economy at the same time. So the states have got a real role to play in making sure that, that the short-term economic impact gets un uh, rolled out quickly. And they've also got um, key roles to play around their own planning and regulatory uh, uh, frameworks because um, in a lot of cases, 
uh, it's actually been um, the states that have held up the opportunity, stopped us exploiting some of the opportunities that we've had for um, new development opportunities. Well, also in 1994, I started spending the money I was earning as a checkout chap at Coles. So that probably had an impact uh, as well. Uh, just with our final question uh, before we hand back uh, to Stuart uh, from Dr. Andrew Walpole, it's really the big one because um, it's made such an impact on our country in the past couple of decades. What do you see as occurring in our relationship with China in coming years? Well, <clears throat> and we only have three hours to discuss this, so you'll need to. I'll, I'll need to be quick. Yeah, look, it, it's 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 difficult, and it's going to get even more so. Um, we we thought a lot of us thought I shouldn't say we a lot of us thought, um, and you can see this in Bob Zellick's writings at the time, that as China got richer, it would be a bit more like us, not a market democracy, but there'd be more sense of individual um, freedoms and it would be a responsible citizen on the global stage. What we didn't anticipate was with Xi Jinping's election that he would take it in a far more militarily and diplomatically muscular direction and would use China's trading relationships to cow other countries. And that's what they're trying to do with us. We are essentially engaged in a negotiation over our sovereignty with them. They are trying to force us to acquiesce to their interests. And uh, remember in doing this, they're doing two things. They're sending a message to us by trying to hurt us, but they're also sending a message to everyone else saying, just watch it because we'll do the same to you that we're doing to these guys. What it means though, is that we need a China strategy and what we've got is a lot of individual initiatives the government has taken, which I don't disagree with, but what is the end game? Uh, when you've got a strategy, it's, you've thought about what your end game is here and how you're trying to manoeuvre towards it. And Australia as a society and governments have not, and, and I say politicians on both sides, have not yet gone down that path. Well, look, everyone uh, watching, please thank you for your, very much for your questions. Martin, thank you for sharing your expertise and your time with our audience. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Uh, back to you, Stuart. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, uh, Martin. Um, lots of other questions I'm sure that people would like to ask, and I saw some of the others that were really good questions. And in normal circumstances, when we're face-to-face, -face, we'd be going into drinks, and then we'd be having a dinner and I'd normally get up and ask the questions that haven't been asked. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that this evening. So Martin, you really do have to come uh, and visit us here at Queen's once things get better. I, I absolutely will, not a, not a problem. An invitation to you and Heather uh, to come visit. Um, I would like to call on one of our students uh, who is the, uh, has been the president of our middle common room uh, this year. Um, Nikita uh, Shuandas. Uh, Nikita is from uh, Malaysia. And I think a fine example of why we need to open up once again to have uh, international students uh, uh, allowed back into to Australia. Queen's has had a long connection with Malaysia going back to uh, the Second World War and former deputy prime ministers and cabinet ministers who, who have come through here and through uh, the University of Melbourne. Uh, Nikita is doing a master's in development studies, and she's also working as an intern with AsiaLink at the moment. And our next event, uh, and here's a little plug, is actually a, a, a dialogue uh, between Indonesia and Australia that we're co-sponsoring uh, with AsiaLink in a couple of weeks' time. It's on our website, and we've got both ambassadors and senior figures from uh, both countries involved in this. And uh, Nikita is, is, is helping us to put, put it together. Um, so she's a wonderful uh, example, I think, of uh, uh, the kind of students we do need to, to continue to have here uh, in Australia. So uh, I would ask Nikita to bring a, a vote of thanks uh, to our, our speaker, Martin, uh, to thank Dan, again, as one of our own, one of our wyverns, 
And uh, after Nikita gives the vote of thanks, we can respond in the normal way with our reactions. And uh, I'm sorry, that's the end of the evening, guys. There's no drinks. Uh, <laughs> drinks are on you. Nikita. Thank you very much, Stuart. I'd like to thank everyone for attending tonight. And of course, say a particular thank you to our speaker, Dr. Martin Parkinson, and to our master of ceremonies, Dan Ziffer, who certainly demonstrated his well-honed journalistic skills for us tonight. As I think was demonstrated through the discussion and the fantastic questions, the topics covered are both challenging and important. And tonight's conversation has certainly provided us all with some very insightful ideas to take forward into future debate. It is shocking how the global pandemic has caused such tremendous economic emergency and the need for globalization to be redefined. I was personally very struck by how vital it is for women to be considered in terms of economic rescue. Furthermore, by focusing on climate change, we can work through the recession and towards sustainable development. Martin's point on needing to focus on fiscal policy rather than monetary policy seems to be a key point in light of the state that the world is in and is now more imperative than ever for fresh ideas to be brought to the table in what is a very evolving time. So thank you again, Martin, for such an enlightening discussion and thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you. Thanks everyone, have uh, a good night and uh, we we'll look forward to uh, seeing you at next year's Sugden Oration, hopefully in person. <laughs> <laughs>